Order. I call this meeting of the Standing Committee on Health to order. This is Tuesday, February 11th, 2020. My name is Suzanne Lonis Croft. I am the Vice Chair and the Chair for this meeting. Um, today we will hear from the Mental Health and Addictions Program of the Nova Scotia Health Authority regarding the Youth Mental Health Outreach Program, Caper Base. I'd like to remind everyone to have their phones off or on vibrate. There are no photos allowed um, during the proceedings except for members of the media. In case of an emergency, please exit through the back door and walk down the hill to Hollis Street and to the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia Courtyard and we will all meet there. I'd like to welcome our new member to the committee, Ms. Chender. Um, this is her first meeting um, and she will be a regular member from the NDP caucus for the health committee. I will ask committee members to introduce themselves by uh, starting with Ms. Di Costanzo. Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, I'm Rafa Di Costanzo, MLA for Clayton Park West. Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Hugh McKay, uh, represent Chester St. Margaret's and I'm filling in for my colleague um, uh, Mr. Irving. I'm Ben Jessam. I'm the member from Hammonds Plains, Lucasville. Bill Horn, MLA for Waverly Fall River, Beaver Bank, and I'm filling in for Honorable Margaret Miller of Hans East. Morning, afternoon, I mean John Lohr, MLA for Kings North, and I'm filling in for Colton LeBlanc. And I'm Barbara Adams, the MLA for Coal Harbor Eastern Passage. Hello, I'm Susan LeBlanc, I'm the MLA for Dartmouth North. Hi, I'm Claudia Chender, I'm the MLA for Dartmouth South. Um, I will ask Ms. Hodder to introduce herself and her uh, colleagues. 
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sam Hodder. I'm the Senior Director for Mental Health and Addictions Program with the Nova Scotia Health Authority. Today, I'm joined by my colleagues, uh, Ruth Harding, who's sit sitting next to me. Uh, she's the Director of Policy and Planning. Uh, to her right is Nadine Wadden, who is the Director of Mental Health and Addictions for the Eastern Zone with the Nova Scotia Health Authority. To Nadine's right is Tara McDonald. She's the Manager of uh, clinical Manager of Child and Adolescent Services for the Guysborough and Canis Strait area and also our lead, provincial lead for the Caper Base Outreach and Adolescent Outreach model. And to Tara's right is Robert Graham. Robert is the Director of Mental Health and Addictions for the Northern Zone. And our Ledge Council today is Mr. Gordon Hebb. Our Committee Clerk is Judy Kavanoff and um, Support Clerk Sherry Mitchell. Um, I'll remind members to wait for me to say their name, uh, to uh, have your red light on your microphone turned on. So I will ask Ms. Um, Hodder to give her opening remarks. So good afternoon members of the Standing Committee on Health. My name is Sam Hodder and I hold the position of Senior Director with the Nova Scotia Health Authority's Mental Health and Addictions Program. We would like to thank you for extending the invitation to myself and my colleagues to talk about the Mental Health and Addictions Program, more specifically our caper based outreach and adolescent outreach model. In 2015, the former nine district health authorities in Nova Scotia merged to become the Nova Scotia Health Authority. Nova Scotia Health Authority is committed to achieving excellence in health, healing and learning through working together. Also in 2015, the Mental Health and Addictions was identified as a priority program and participated in a health services planning process. The goal was to strategically plan for a continuum of services and system supports to better meet the needs of Nova Scotians. In 2017, jointly with the IWK, we released a report titled Milestones on Our Journey, which outlined the planning process and key priorities for improvement. You've received a copy of that within your package. The Nova Scotia Health Authority's Mental Health and Addictions Program also recently released our new strategic program plan called Direction 2025. And central to Direction 2025 is improving access to the right level of care so that people can better manage their conditions and work towards recovery. A positive recovery journey allows, requires that people get accessed and are matched to the right service at the right place, in the right time, and by the right provider. Matching the level of service to the needs of people includes everything from upstream health promotion and early intervention strategies, to therapy and community and outpatient settings, to specialized treatment that may be provided in an inpatient care environment. The CAPER base and adolescent outreach service is one of the services that exists within the broader mental health and addictions program. It consists of a multidisciplinary team of health professionals designed to address the needs of youth aged 13 to 24. The team works closely with youth, schools, families and the community to create solutions and opportunities and supports that provide them with the building blocks to live healthy and productive lives. Caper-based outreach services originated from Health Canada's drug treatment funding strategy in the mid-2000s and works within Health Canada's best practice framework, which identifies four domains of practice, screening, early and brief intervention, outreach and community linkages. The team has made significant progress over the years in engaging youth and they took had to take on a new approach, which is going where youth are at. It is critical that we reach out and intervene early in order to change or improve the trajectory of our youth lives. The outreach worker supports youth in a safe, confidential way to improve personal goals and to take concrete actions to achieve them through individual and group-based work. Staff also help with the navigation to more intensive clinical services where they're needed. We also provide and make referrals to other community-based organizations. In addition to providing services in schools, CaperBase opened Access 808, which is a one-stop resource centre aimed at reaching youth who may be not connected with the formal health school system. The evaluations of both of these services uh, per showed to be very promising and youth were accessing and developing strong connections that allowed them to build and improve resilience and see their full potential. Based on the results, the Department of Health and Wellness provided sustainable resources to ensure that these services would continue. In 2017, Dr. Stan Kutcher, an expert in the field of child and youth mental health, submitted recommendations at the, at the request of the Departments of Health and Wellness and Education and Early Childhood Development to address the gaps in mental health supports in Nova Scotia. 
One of these, recommenda one of these recommendations included enhancing the existing services in Eastern Zone and expansion of services in Western and Northern Zones. Since the release of these recommendations, the province has invested $3.4 million over four years to expand outreach services, and we have since been able to hire just over 14 full-time employees to complement this team. Currently, we're working in 99 schools in Nova Scotia. The team is offering three evidence-based programs which focus on promoting healthy living, coping, and exploring and discovering their strengths. Recently, we asked a youth who had accessed the Adolescent Outreach Services to share how it has impacted their lives, and they stated, it. We started off with a safety plan, which really helped in the long run, so I know what to do if I'm having a moment of panic or stress. It also helped me with self-evaluation, because I never see myself as worth it. Seeing the adolescent outreach worker over time has not only improved that, but improved my mood. As you can tell from this quote, the impact that this service has had on youth, their families, the communities in Nova Scotia is immeasurable. We thank you for giving us the opportunity to share and talk more about this today. Thank you, Ms. Hodder. We will start with our round of questions. We'll begin with the PC Caucus for 20 minutes. Ms. Adams. Thank you very much for being here. And uh, I appreciate that this is a very sensitive topic. And so um, I, I encourage anybody who is actually watching at home with children that they might want to consider um, watching it with them or taking note of the subjects that are going to be raised here because some of them may be upsetting to children. Um, I want to refer to the January 2020 framework for Nova Scotia on the prevention and reduction of the risk of suicide. So just so we're not all clear on what we're talking about, in that report it says that in the previous year 112 Nova Scotians died by suicide. So the report goes on to say that 1,124 lost their lives to suicide between 2007 and 2016. So those are the ones that we know about for that reason. So the report goes on to say that the number of people who attempted suicide is far higher. So that's where I want to start with. So the stats that we were given said between 2011 and 2016, there were 13,746 Nova Scotians who attempted to take their own lives. That means that there's 2,749 people in Nova Scotia trying to take their own lives every year, which when you do the math, that means that seven and a half people are trying to take their own lives every day. So I just want to put that in perspective. That's a lot of people every day. That means seven and a half people are going to try today. And those are the numbers that we were given. I'm wondering where we read a new uh, press release yesterday um, from the Department of Health and Wellness about an improvement in the numbers of mental health services at the IWK. But the wait times around the province have not improved significantly that I'm aware of. So the first question, and it's open to whoever wants to answer it, is can you tell me what the wait times are for non-urgent care for youth and adults in the industrial Cape Breton area? Who would like to take that? Okay, thank you. Ms. Hodder? Thanks for the question. Um, so we have made um, significant improvements in relation to access to services and in relation to our wait times. Um, fortunately, we have our uh, director, uh, Nadine Wadden, here to speak specifically around uh, the Caper and Industrial Area wait times. That is an area that um, we are certainly aware of um, that has um, is having challenges in relation to uh, meeting our standards in relation to weights. Um, and she'll speak specifically about uh, the wait times in that area. Um, many of the improvements that we have seen um, across the province um, are meeting the standards um, for our weights. And I can go into a little bit of detail um, after, um, after Nadine answers the specific question in relation to the weights for the industrial Cape Breton area. Ms. Wadden. Hi. Um, you're right in terms of we do want to acknowledge, as um, Ms. Hodder has said, that um, we are working uh, very hard to reducing our wait times, especially in the Cape Breton uh, industrial area. 
in our uh, most recent quarter from October to December 2019, um, we have been, I, I think it's important to start with noting that we have been the average wait time for urgent, so within the seven day standard. So the average is that um, the six days wait for um, child and adolescent in the industrial area, once they've been triaged as urgent, the average is wait is six days. And so we are meeting that standard um, within 93% of the time in the Cape Breton area. Where we have much room for improvement is in our non-urgent cases, in which we have seen a recent rise from 62 days as our average to an average of 125 days, um, which again we know is too long to wait for our non-urgent cases. Um, Ms. Hodder, were you adding anything? So I'll just um, I'll just kind of um, talk a little bit about sort of some of our provincial improvements, and then I'll talk a little bit. Ms. Adams. Yeah, I, I'm not didn't ask about the improvements. I asked about the wait times. So that's the answer that I was looking for. Okay. So you want to so, ask another question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ms. Adams. Okay. So I want to clarify that when you talk about the urgent wait times. You're, refer you're referencing when 50% are meeting the target, that that's the six days, because I've got it right here in front of me that I printed off from the website yesterday. Um, so the actual wait times for urgent is eight days. So the only time that any region or clinic is meeting the non-urgent wait times, according to your stats, is one clinic, that's Colchester Regional Clinic. So according to what I see here, it says your non-urgent target is to be seen within 28 days. So uh, industrial Cape Breton clinics is 285 days for adults and 204 days. So that's not anywhere close to meeting um, the targets. And you just said that the average rise went from 62 to 126 days. So we're moving in, way in the wrong direction. So the only one who's even close is Colchester at 21 days. Um, for 90% to meet that, which is what we're, we're talking about here. Um, so where we have so many of these people who are waiting such an extended period of time, I want to talk about the actual budget that we're putting towards this, because budget's going to dictate wait times. So according to Statistics Canada with respect to the reporting of perceived need, uh, in Nova Scotia there's 94,000 who are reporting a perceived need for mental health services in Nova Scotia. According to the NSHA's by the numbers for 2017-2018, 325,593 Nova Scotians got mental health visits. The next year, it went up to 369,000 in terms of total visits. But when you actually looked at the number of people who got that care, it dropped from one year to the last from 44,300 down to 42,998. So we have fewer people in this province getting access to mental health care and the wait times have doubled. So can you tell me how much the Department of Health and Wellness has changed the budget for mental health services over the last five years and whether you think that's enough money to have in the budget for mental health services? Ms. Hodder. So we've seen, uh, to answer your spe uh, specific question, we've seen a budget increase over the last five years of around 14% for mental health and addictions. We're operating um, with a combination of um, lead sheet, off lead sheet uh, resources. Um, our total budget for mental health and addictions for last fiscal year was and just under $186 million. Ms. Adams. Great. So I appreciate that number. According to... Stats Canada, the amount of budget increase between 2009-2010 to 2017-2018 across the country was an average of 25% increase in budget. In Newfoundland, they increased the budget over that period of time by 39%, PEI uh, 87%, New Brunswick 23%. Nova Scotia was 12% according to those stats, so it may be 14%. So we are way behind every other province in terms of spending on mental health services. So do you think the amount of money that's being spent by this province 
has impacted the wait times, especially in Cape Breton. Ms. Hodder? I'll take that. Um, I think that the investments have been significant over the last five years um, in relation to mental health and addictions. Um, we've been identified as a priority in the province and have seen uh, more investment over the last five years in mental health and addictions than we had in previous, uh, previous fiscal years. Um, in terms of the impact on wait times and access to services, I, I do believe we have seen significant improvements across the province in relation to both adult and child services. We do have an area um, in which you have pointed out um, that is significantly challenged and the primary reason for that uh, challenge is in relation to um, not, a financial, uh, not a financial resource, is in relation to a significant and critical shortage in relation to human resources. So we have, and that directly impacted our wait times, we have significant vacancies within that area um, of Cape Breton, um, hard to fill positions. Positions, um, and that has significantly impacted both the wait times in child and the adult community mental health and addictions. Ms. Adams. Okay, so I'm a little confused because you said that there was a significant um, spending increase in mental health and yet I just quoted the stats that we are far behind every other province at only 12% the year before, maybe 14% last year when the average across the country is 25%. So I don't see that as a significant increase when we're that far behind everybody else. And you also just said, if I'm correct, that there was a significant reduction in wait times and yet we were just told that there was a, a rise on average in non-urgent wait times from 62 to 125 days across the province. So that's, that. I don't see how that marries with what was just said. Um, the Auditor General in his 2017 November report on mental health services asked about the budget spending and he has the budget um, listed on page 37. And one of the comments what he, what he, with what he said, and I'll just read it, it says, health authority management told us that funding is generally based on the prior year budget. Uh, the necessary funding adjustments are made if required to mitigate short-term risk, but based Basing funding levels on historical values is not an effective approach to budgeting um, and there should be a correction for how the budget for mental health services is done. So I'm wondering if anyone can tell me if there has been a change in how the budgeting for mental health services is being done. Can you table that report please? Who's take Ms. Hodder? Just a point of clarification, the wait times have not increased across the province. We have one uh, area in the industrial Cape Breton area that has seen a peak or a rise within their wait times. All other clinics across the province have seen a significant decrease, so I would like to have that on record that we have, um, have not seen that trend in relation to our urgent response in terms of access, nor our non-urgent across other clinics for mental health and addictions within the adult or child space. So it's a point of clarification around that. Um, in relation to the overall budget, that there is a um, the Department of Health and Wellness would probably be in best position in relation to um, decision making over the um, budget allocation of resources, um, which they're not here today to speak to that, but in relation to overall planning, um, we certainly do that in a collaborative way in terms of identifying needs and areas for improvement um, and where resource investment would be. Um, and we have seen that um, in the last um, in the last five years where we have identified priorities um, in relation to our intake services, in relation to our school's mental health, in relation to the topic that we're here to discuss today in terms of caper base and adolescent outreach, where there has been a crisis in urgent care, where there has been strategic investments made um, in, ter in terms of enhancing those services within the Nova Scotia Health Authority. Okay, did you table that report? Oh. Okay, Ms. Adams. Thank you, and I, I appreciate the distinction between significant increase, but as a researcher, um, the public, when they see that it's 284 days for wait time for non-urgent care, a significant increase from whatever it was to 284 days doesn't feel like very much. So I wanted to ask you to clarify for me uh, and for those watching, how do you define what is considered triage one level emergency care 
versus triage to urgent care where the target is to be seen within seven days. What does someone have to say or do in order to be identified as a triage one emergency versus an urgent? Who would like to take that? Ms. Hodder. So um, we have spent a significant amount of time in this province in, in creating our triage criteria and guidelines for access to community mental health and addictions. That was through our access and navigation uh, initiative. Um, today with us we have our project lead, uh, which is Robert Graham, and he will provide um, some detail in relation to those three triage categories, which is emergent, urgent, and non-urgent. Mr. Graham. Sure. So when we're triaging uh, people for services, we look at a number of factors, uh, both uh, risk and protective factors that may be in place for them. So we ask people a series of questions around uh, how they're currently functioning and uh, what their um, previous diagnosis may have been if they've had one before, uh, any medications that they're taking, uh, how is their home life going, uh, what supports do they have in place, uh, were there any previous uh, suicide attempts uh, or thoughts or risks of suicide. Uh, we throughout NSHA uh, do have a suicide risk assessment uh, policy and procedure uh, that all staff follow. Uh, so we use that to form the basis of uh, whether or not somebody would be emergent and we'd be looking for them to attend to a local emergency department or we may in fact uh, be calling uh, the police to attend to them on an urgent basis. Uh, so it is around that, that risk piece uh, for the emergent. Uh, for urgent, uh, it would be that there is not an imminent risk right now, uh, but we do feel that uh, this person should be seen uh, in the next several days. So there are risk factors present, uh, but there are some protective factors as well uh, that would deem we do need to see them quickly, uh, but it is not uh, an emergent situation that needs to be dealt with right now. Uh, and then sort of our last category would be a regular or a non-urgent. Uh, and those are people who may be suffering from moderate to severe mental illness that's impacting their daily functioning, uh, but there are no uh, particular risk factors there right now that would deem uh, that they have to be seen within the seven day standard. So there wouldn't be uh, a current risk of suicide um, or other factors uh, that the team would be considering when making that clinical judgment. So we use those three categories consistently amongst the team uh, following the policy that's in place around that. Ms. Adams. I have a time for a couple questions, I think. So if someone comes into Emerge, and these are true stories, somebody comes into Emerge having tried to take their own life, what's the standard length of time that they would be in Emerge? Um, I have several people that I know who have come into Emerge having done something to try to take their own life. They weren't successful, thank God. But they were sent home within 12 to 24 hours, and in one case, they were told that they couldn't be held at the hospital or provided with any immediate or urgent services because there was no room at the inn, was the quote. So if someone has come into the hospital, um, and we've got 7.5 attempting every day, showing up and emerge, which are gonna be held there for care, and, and how do you decide who gets to be sent home? Who wants to answer that? Mr. Graham. So we work uh, very closely with our emergency departments uh, who will be doing the initial triaging of anybody uh, that's coming in through the ED. Uh, so their staff uh, will do that initial work and make a decision on whether or not they want to consult uh, mental health and addictions uh, to come and uh, have us do an assessment or if the emergency room physician uh, feels confident enough in their own assessment. Uh, so either of those uh, scenarios can take place where it's the ER doctor's assessment and he, is make, he or she is making a decision uh, around discharge and future steps. Uh, if they do consult uh, with our crisis team, a member of our crisis team would go. 
Uh, they would also do an assessment and then meet with the ER physician uh, to determine next steps. They may uh, consult with a member of the psychiatry team as well uh, if they feel the person warrants uh, that level of assessment. Uh, if after psychiatry's done their assessment, uh, they feel that an inpatient uh, stay is necessary, uh, we now have a provincial uh, bed management system uh, for mental health and addictions. So uh, we would look to see where is the closest available bed uh, available for that person, and the psychiatrist uh, would do up the admission orders around that uh, and then work uh, with our provincial med ma bed management coordinator uh, to send that person to that specific location. Uh, so we do get reports on a regular basis um, and uh, bed availability has not uh, been an issue in quite some time. Um, so when we, look at, uh, when we look at those numbers, we see every day where beds are available in the province and consistently over the last number of months, uh, there has always been a bed Order. available. Order, time so. has lapsed for the PC caucus. We'll turn it over to the NDP caucus for 20 minutes. Ms. LeBlanc. Thanks, Mr. Graham. I'm happy if you just want to finish your thought there. Uh, go ahead and then I can, yeah. Mr. Graham. Sorry. Uh, I was just going to say that um, because we do now have that data available, we're much in a better place now to be able to provide somebody a bed if, in fact, they require that level of care. Ms. LeBlanc. Well, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to start with a question based on the release that happened uh, two days ago or so when there was an article today or yesterday, I don't know what day it is, um, uh, about the, the uh, sort of um, the better news in wait times at the IWK. Um, and so, you know, my understanding is that those wait times have been significantly reduced, and that's great. I know that there have been new positions added, uh, which is obviously, you know, a big part of it. There's people to see people when they come in, uh, which I applaud. Um, uh, but I have a question about, about, so my understanding is that the, you know, you go in and you get your first, your choice appointment uh, first or, or within, you know, the right amount of time or a, a small amount of time, uh, which is great. But then my understanding is that we don't have as much data on then what happens then. So if someone presents at the IWK, gets their choice appointment, just, you know, it's, it's discerned that, you know, a, a, a course of, um, you know, therapy appointments with a certain social worker or a certain counselor is what's appropriate. Can you outline kind of what is happening now with, with that sort of like following the first, the choice appointment? So how long do people wait for the second appointment? And then, you know, and, and how does it look? Who wants that? Ms. Hodder? Um, so I'll start with, with that, um, with response to that. So I can't speak in relation to the IWK because we are two separate organizations within the province, Nova Scotia Health Authority, IWK, but we work very, very collaboratively together um, in relation to provision of child services and operate utilizing the same framework, which is the choice and partnership approach, which is what you had referenced there. Um, in relation to our wait times for child and adolescent services across the province, um, and, and uh, which we, which we term wait one, which is the time from the referral and the intake, so that, that initial contact between, um, you know, I need help and the, the response time in, in relation to a mental health clinician providing that response and determining that triage criteria that uh, Robert Graham had just described, um, we track and measure that 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 wait period. Um, come April, uh, to, um, this April, this spring 2020, um, we will be, um, or we have our infrastructure in place where we're actually going to be able to be publicly reporting on uh, wait two, which is uh, the point in time between that first choice uh, visit and what we would call a partnership within the adult uh, services. So those uh, wait times will be able to be uh, publicly available um, in July. So we have to get through the first quarter of visits in order to actually report on those um, from April onwards. Um, I can turn it over to uh, Ruth Harding to provide a little bit more detail um, in relation to that overall process if you'd like if you'd like that a little more information um, Ms. LeBlanc. thanks I'll just ask a some maybe more clarifying question so I I totally um, 
Yes, I get that the, you're a different entity than IWK, and I was thinking that I, I made a mistake there. I was thinking that the, there was um, someone from the department was here about to, to talk about the overarching. So I apologize for that. But yeah, so in, so if you could like translate the question then to adult services, um, what are um, for adult services in like central zone? Let's say, uh, can you talk? Can you sort of answer the same question for, uh, or maybe you you saying you can't answer that until July? Ms. Potter. <laughs> That's correct, but just to be clear, uh, for, we do provide child services um, within our Eastern Zone, Northern Zone, and Western Zone for community mental health and addictions, and then IWK provides a provision of child services within the HRM area for community mental health and addictions for where those wait times for scheduled appointments are. So just a point of clarification that the Nova Scotia Health Authority provides um, provision of child services within our rural um, zones. And in relation to that uh, question is, is that um, we can't report on that by zone or provincially right now in relation to that, but we will be able to um, share that information um, with the public um, in July of 2020. Okay. Ms. LeBlanc. And sort of, can you just explain to me again the reason you can't report on that? Because like clearly you're seeing people and people are waiting and people have wait times. So how come that information is not available? Is it a new uh, like data management system or something? Yes. Ms. Hodder. The first piece of our sort of infrastructure in our registration build within the enterprise system of our Meditech within our rural zones was to get the weight measures in place and consistency around that for our time, point in time between referral and first visit. So that was our first level of accountability. And so um, getting sort of that data and consistency around the tracking and reporting of that for our weight to measure um, was our next step within that overall process. Ruth, is there anything you'd like to add on that? Okay. Okay, Ms. LeBlanc. Great, so thanks. Um, so I just want to go back to the wait times in Cape Breton for a minute. Um, so um, I really appreciate the collaborative work that the Cape Breton program is doing with schools, uh, but understand that the focus is on the, um, is working on the needs of youth who require support as, oppo as opposed to treatment uh, for a mental disorder. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how the, uh, how the NSHA is addressing the gaps in accessing service for the youth who require treatment. Who wants to take that? Ms. Hodder? Oh. Tara McDonald? Ms. McDonald. Hello. Uh, in terms of, um, for the gap in terms of treatment, it really does come back to actively recruiting clinicians because as Ms. Hodder mentioned, that is, the, that is the issue is that there is a lack of human resources. So when you look at the data in terms of being able to offer um, services, it's the clinicians that are offering those services in the, in the community clinics. And so without the clinicians, uh, the wait times grow. And so the focus in Cape Breton has been on actively recruiting. We've been looking at incentives. We've been recruiting nationally um, and, and trying to go to actually schools where we've got masters of social work, masters of psychology, PhD psychologists trying to actively recruit uh, to be able to, to fill uh, the recruitment challenges. Thank you. Ms. LeBlanc. Okay, great. So then can we talk a little bit, just dig a little deeper down into that? Because we know, uh, as we've already heard, um, that the wait time in industrial Cape Breton for um, non-urgent uh, care is 204 days currently. Um, so it's about recruitment. So there's an, you're doing incentives, you're doing all kinds of things. So where are we? Like how many, uh, how many uh, positions need to be filled? Uh, what are you hearing about why those positions are difficult to fill? How come people aren't coming to take those jobs? Ms. McDonald or no? Oh, sorry, Ms. Wadden. Okay. Hi, I'd be happy to answer that. Um, in terms of recruitment, absolutely, in terms of looking at the, the level of service that something like outreach can provide, and your question is really looking at um, access to when it becomes at that clinic level and needs treatment within the community clinics, um, which uh, my colleagues have shared, certainly there is a gap in recruitment um, resources. You know, the reasons are multifaceted in terms of living in, in a rural community. We're often faced with clinicians who are looking to, um, to move into bigger cities and relocate. And so um, I would 
I would say a, a, a large proportion is, is based on our geography and where we're located in terms of being able to um, recruit, not only recruit, but then retain um, new, even newer grads um, to our area. And so often we see, um, we will we'll try to um, offer a return of service agreements and so we can sort of have some sustainability for a number of years in terms of offering, um, especially looking at targeting some of those newer grads. Um, but certainly, um, as um, Ms. McDonald had mentioned, in terms of we need to sort of go that next layer in terms of really partnering with our universities and our, um, and our education system in terms of looking at what else we can do to recruit those individuals. Um, of course, we have um, other sort of stand, standard leaves of absences from work as well in terms of that also um, comes into play in terms of um, having vacancies on, on temporary basis as well in terms of adding an additional layer of um, challenge in terms of recruiting into temporary positions too when individuals are on, on, are on leaves of absences, I would, um, I would say, but really looking at also, um, some of the some of the negative narrative that has come around in terms of working in in Cape Breton, and I would say that um, the clinicians and the staff that we have, and the employees that we have, are working um, very hard and are very dedicated to the service. And in terms of trying to recruit, we all play a role into trying to lean into that and uh, and and make Cape Breton an area that people want to come um, and work and start their career or stay in their career in Cape Breton. Ms. LeBlanc. It's like the work that my colleague Claudia Chender and I are doing to try to get doctors to come and live and work in Dartmouth. I understand it. Um, okay, so uh, given that, I'm wondering if someone could uh, provide us with um, a list of the positions within the NSHA working within child and youth mental health by region, and if you can, in those lists, identify any vacancies. Um, is that something that you could provide to us? Later, Ms. Hodder. or now, <laughs> yeah. Ms. Hodder. Thanks for the question. So what we can do is provide that detailed information to all members of the committee um, in relation to our vacancies um, across the province by clinic within the child and adolescent uh, community mental health um, and addictions clinics or outpatient services. And we can also provide that for our adult as well. Yeah. Ms. LeBlanc. Yeah. Great, thank you. And it's not just the vacancies, but actually all of the positions and then which ones are vacant. That'd be great. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about, um, sorry, one second. I wanted to talk about, um, we have a, a fact sheet uh, from Proof, which is a research program on food insecurity in Canada that indicates, or that's, yeah, indicates that uh, household food insecurity is strongly related to mental health. And I've just come from a meeting with a number of people in Dartmouth North uh, who are facing eviction right now. And I would tell you like 100% that affordable housing and a stable, more than affordable, but stable housing is also directly connected with mental health. Um, Canadians living in food insecure households are at greater risk of poor mental health uh, than those living in food secure households. Um, and this increases with the severity of the insecurity. It's <laughs> a lot of words here. Um, so not surprisingly, the health consequences of food insecurity take a huge toll on our healthcare system. Um, and in the April volume of the Walrus magazine, um, it was reported that with nearly 20% of its population affected, Halifax has the highest rate of food insecurity among Canadian cities. And we have the highest rate of uh, food bank usage. And I know that in Cape Breton, uh, where wait times are the longest and people are having the most difficulty with access to mental health services, uh, child poverty is higher than um, in most places in the country, well, it, in most places in the province. So where there's child poverty, there's food insecurity. So I'm um, wondering if you can uh, tell me a little bit about how food insecurity is showing up in the work that's happening uh, on the ground level in mental health and addiction services, and particularly with youth. Ms. McDonald. Certainly when we look at, so the, the adolescent outreach model is, is looking to, to try to provide a service to at-risk youth. When we look at who is at risk, certainly children living in homes where there's limited food is, is certainly a risk factor. Um, 
it affects uh, it affects uh, outreach and treatment in a variety of ways. It's from a treatment perspective, it's hard to do to do treatment with a youth when they're hungry. Um, and in terms of even being within the classroom, um, teachers report that that it's it's very challenging for for children to have sustained attention to be able to engage in in um, an effective way when when they're hungry. And so one of the things that our outreach program does is in terms of all of our group programs, we offer a nutrition, tr nutritional snack um, that, uh, that's provided to all of the, the youth that engage in the program. Uh, we worked with our partners in terms of breakfast programs, food banks, um, and certainly in terms of Cape Breton, we have, uh, as Ms. Hodder mentioned, Access 808, where uh, youth are able to come and access emergency food bank um, uh, food resources when, when needed. But, but certainly, um, when we look at how we're going to impact mental health, looking at food security is one of the, the primary things that we need to address, including all of the social determinants of health. Thank you. Ms. LeBlanc. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Yes, <laughs> I, I totally agree that um, like nutritional, like snacks at programs and things like that are really important, obviously. And you know, as someone who is often hungry, I'm always like grabbing something, and I'm lucky that I'm able to you know grab food here and there. Um, but obviously, the, it's a more systemic problem than someone being hungry as they show up for treatment. And I'm wondering, you know, and I and I. So often at this committee, I bring uh, issues up of the social determinants of health, and everyone nods their head as you are doing now because all of the people working on the ground understand that it's a serious issue. And then we still see it as a serious issue three and four years later. So what is happening? Why, you know, so my question is, is the NSHA having these conversations with the Department of Health and Wellness? Is somebody saying, look, people can't function. Mental health is deteriorating because people can't find places to live. Mental health is deteriorating because people can't eat. They're not able to eat enough food to keep, you know, to, to, to stave off the stress of, 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 um, of being hungry. So I'm wondering if those conversations are happening and I'm wondering um, how the, the NSHA is working with government departments, not just the health and wellness department, uh, to address the issues uh, you know, understanding that we know that there's direct connection. Who wants to take that? Ms. Hodder? Yeah, so certainly within the Nova Scotia Health Authority and um, with our colleagues at the IWK, we're having those uh, having those conversations and looking at sort of the policy opportunities to work uh, collaboratively with, with other departments within the schools in relation to the community response in relation to those uh, social determinants of health. So it's a high priority for us to be involved within those conversations and make contributions um, um, based on sort of the provider experience and, and what Tara had said in relation to what we're experiencing in relation to the, the delivery arm um, within that. We also work, um, we have uh, within mental health and addictions a um, a group of, uh, of health promotion specialists that work with uh, within our program area who collaborate very much with uh, public health services in relation to um, having community conversations, um, working with municipalities and um, pulling on those policy levers essentially to create those uh, supportive environments in relation to that. So there is resources that are dedicated towards having those um, conversations and identifying it from an influencing perspective perspective and an advocacy perspective about all of the critical things um, that you're talking about in relation to the social determinants of health. Yeah. Ms. LeBlanc. Time to have? Three minutes. <clears throat> okay. Um, so in 2012, the NDP government established Nova Scotia's first mental health strategy based on extensive community consultation and collaboration. The 2017 Auditor General's report found that the strategy was poorly managed by the Liberal government, that aspects of the strategy were not completed within the fi first five years, or the five years, and that there was no evaluation at the end of the strategy to determine its impact or effectiveness. One might um, think, one might state, that it's the government's reorganization of the health authority that took priority over this, uh, the provision of actual mental health services. So there were three actions in the mental health strategy which had been uh, not been um, 
been started when the Auditor General conducted his review. There had been no uh, work st uh, started on sex, gender, and diversity review of services. So has there been any gender-based and diversity review of services conducted since then, since 2017? And if not, does the NSHJ have any sense of whether existing mental health services are accessible or appropriate for women, including trans women, non-binary folks, or LGBTQ plus communities generally? We'd like to take that. Ms. Hodder. Um, so a piece around that is, uh, just from an accountability perspective, is the Nova Scotia Health Authority isn't accountable f um, or doesn't own the um, Together We Can strategy for uh, 2020, or that was released in 2012. However, we do utilize it as a fundamental document in relation to our planning. There was a significant amount of consultations and key priority areas that we have mobilized uh, within that and working with the department and the IWK. So just to note that um, that strategy is, is still a foundation document in relation to our work and all of the consultations that went into that um, piece of work. Um, we have um, mobilized within mental health and addictions um, in the Nova Scotia Health Authority a provincial uh, centre for training and education and learning which has been just launched this year which um, is really about um, competency development not just for new uh, employees and clinicians onboarding um, but also um, in relation to our existing employees and the practice supports. Um, um, so working with women, having a trauma-informed uh, care approach uh, for both child and adult are certainly um, areas of, of um, priority for us uh, in relation to our provincial um, in relation to our provincial center for training, education, and learning. Um, in relation to the approach and the uh, therapies that we utilize when delivering services uh, to both child and adult. But I wouldn't be able to comment on specifically whether or not that that deliverable had been achieved or not from the Department of Health and Wellness perspective, respectfully. Ms. LeBlanc? Oh. Yeah, any thoughts on, um, on services, particular for mental health services for trans people, um, either you know, pre-transition um, pre or through transition? Mr. Graham, very quickly. <laughs> Uh, so we've been uh, actively working with the IWK on having staff actually trained in doing the trans health assessments. Uh, so we now have staff uh, in each of the zone who have that training uh, and are providing that Order. resource now. Time has lapsed. Ms. D. Costanzo for the Liberal Caucus, 20 minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for all the information. If I can start, actually, just to uh, look at how mental health has been in the last 10 years. My kids went to high school 10 years ago, and there was very little compared to what there is, to, what there is now. And as more time passes and we're hearing more of the things that are happening within high schools, if you can highlight for me what is uh, the, the program School Plus and the new adolescent and how are they working together. Just the things that I hear are amazing and where are they happening, if you don't mind. Ms. McDonald. So the, the two services, so the Schools Plus uh, is, um, is overseen by the Department of Education, but it really looks to do interagency uh, collaboration between a number of service providers that are within the school, including Department of Education, Department of Justice, uh, folks from community services, as well as mental health and addictions. And so um, what you'll see is within schools, you have staff that are really looking to try to coordinate services for youth so that there isn't duplication. You'll hear from, we, what well, we, we hear from principals and administrators, guidance counselors, is that there's actually a number of professionals providing youth services within the schools. And so one of the focuses is making sure that we can, that uh, those services are coordinated and that there's no gaps that are existing. Adolescent outreach, which is why we're here today, is a piece of that. So we work uh, collaboratively with uh, Schools Plus. Our focus is really looking at uh, providing service to middle and high school students who are at risk for mental health and substance use issues. So that is kind of one of the distinguishing factors between us and Schools Plus, is that we're really focused on mental health and substance use concerns, whereas Schools Plus is looking at kind of the broader uh, continuum of supports. 
Certainly, um, we partner very regularly. So that what that could look like is that uh, we provide group, pro group programming together. Um, we sit on on case conferences. So the two services certainly are um, very uh, collaborative and complementary of one another. Ms. De Costanzo. Thank you, and, and this is really an amazing thing for, for our kids at, th at this time. But uh, I know stigma is really one of the biggest issues when it comes to mental health. Are these kids accessing it? How are you monitoring, um, for example, if the kids end up in emergency, uh, the adolescents, is there a question where have they accessed what's available at School Plus or this, and or are they accessing after they end up in emergency? I'm just wanting to hear about the access. I, we can provide all the programs in the world if there is that uh, stigma that's related, kids are not accessing it. And what are you doing to make sure they access it? Ms. McDonald. So uh, the, the staff work really hard to establish um, initiatives within the school that are looking at to reduce stigma. And kind of one of the, the fundamentals is that we want to be visible. We want the youth within the school to know that if I need support and I need uh, accessible support in, in my school that I can go see a particular staff person because, uh, because they work with mental health and addictions. And so um, there is a number of initiatives. Uh, Headstrong is certainly uh, one that has been quite successful in Cape Breton and, and is um, expanding to other areas, but whereby you bring up, you, you bring together a group of students uh, that are brought together to really talk about what can we do to uh, increase mental health literacy, how can we uh, look to reduce stigma within the schools, and so um, I had the opportunity to sit in on, on a session in Cape Breton and I think there was over 90 youth that were together and true leaders in their schools and really caring about how to improve um, mental health services and uh, to really hear their voice and what's working for them. So in terms of, we, we've got dedicated uh, resources and focus on stigma within the schools. If a, a youth goes to the ER and they're connected with our service, certainly that communication is happening between providers. Um, right now, the focus is, though, on really doing global stigma-reducing initiatives within the school. Ms. D. Costanzo. Thank you. And maybe if you can outline, I know you're doing it in the um, Western Zone and the Northern Zone, or you started in Cape Britain, which is the Northern Zone. Uh, and how did you come up with just that area and what is happening in the, there's four zones, if I understand it correctly, what is happening in, in the central zone, which what my riding is in, and I, I'm really, ex I was excited to hear that they're bringing the mental health program, but it ended up at Citadel, not at Halifax West, uh, and how do these decisions are made, and when will it be at every high school? Ms. McDonald. Sure. Um, okay, so... Uh, the Caper Base Outreach Service initiated actually an Eastern Zone in Cape Breton. And so it was, as Ms. Hodder referenced, it was part of, it was uh, developed as part of the drug treatment strategy funding. And we had a number of positions that were based in Cape Breton. In 2017, there was um, an, a number of suicides of Cape Breton youth. And so uh, the Department of Health and Wellness had um, commissioned, I, I suppose, uh, Dr. Stan Kutcher to come to Cape Breton and have community conversations with, with youth, with families that were, were, were struggling. And so one of the things that Dr. Kutcher heard was that um, how Caper Base, which had been, um, had been being implemented for a number of years, youth actually actively talked about the benefit of having outreach within the schools. And so that then led to the recommendation for the expansion into Western and Northern zones, which is what we've done. Uh, in terms of Central Zone, uh, that would be covered by the IWK. And so while I'm aware that IWK certainly has outreach programs and they have Schools Plus, um, they wouldn't be covered under kind of this initiative within NSHA. Okay, Ms. D. Costanzo. Thank you. Um, the other question that I had was, um, you also mentioned, sorry, um, in the opening remarks that there is Direction 2025 and Access 808. These are things that I'm not familiar with. If you can expand on those, I would be really appreciative. Ms. Hodder. 
Um, so Direction 2025 was um, initiated about a year and a half ago amongst our uh, uh, program leadership team within the Nova Scotia Health Authority and in collaboration with the IWK, which was essentially to look at, you know, what are the specific things that we want to do for improvement, um, access being one of the top uh, areas of improvement that we're trying to uh, try to influencing um, over the next three to five years. Um, so it was our strategic plan essentially that will guide our direction over the next three to five years. And we have um, a number of initiatives that are um, essentially bundled within that, um, looking at um, things around um, you know our relationship with uh, primary health care and the collaboration around that. Um, E-mental health, which we haven't talked about uh, here today, um, but that is, a, um, that is on the horizon for us in relation to providing um, high engagement with a low intensity of service uh, for um, Nova Scotians, and we're, we're really excited about the launch of that that's gonna be happening um, actually in April of this year that we'll be able to be providing uh, e-mental health services uh, to Nova Scotians, um, which will be another access point uh, for people. Um, with no wait, they'll be able to access it immediately. Um, other things that were identified within Direction 2025 was that we uh, must meet our urgent criteria that was set out um, and that we will have targets set to reduce the non-urgent criteria for wait times in relation to that. Um, looking at our withdrawal management services um, and how those are delivered within our uh, within our current uh, uh, within our current program. Um, um, our data and in terms of sort of our weight two measures as was referenced earlier in the conversation today, our training and development and I did reference some of that as well in, in my previous conversation but essentially that is what Direction 2025 is, is, a, is, our, is our roadmap for uh, the Nova Scotia Health Authority Mental Health and Addictions Program over the next three to five years of where, uh, where our goals are, where our targets are and so that we can, we can monitor um, we can uh, make adjustments um, in relation to resource allocation, um, you know, funding opportunities, um, all of those sorts of things uh, over the next three to five years. Access 808 was a, um, and I'll let Tara um, McDonald speak a little bit more about this, but um, essentially um, that was referenced in my opening remarks and it is, um, it's essentially um, recognized in the Cape Breton area that there was a gap uh, in service for school for students or for uh, children and youth um, who are not necessarily connected up with the school system, um, and uh, so they range between uh, the age range for the for the house is between uh, 16 to 24, and they do offer group. Um, it's kind of a drop-in resource center, and we have uh, mental health uh, care professionals that work within that uh, drop-in center. Um, and it's a place, it's a hub, essentially. Um, and Tara spoke a little bit about that earlier in relation to, you know, looking at what are the goals, meeting the youth where they're at, um, you know, helping them connect up with community-based resources, um, referrals uh, and or connections with more intensive clinical services if, that, if that's if that's something that's required or needed by that uh, youth. Um, and so that, I believe, started in 2012. Ms. McDonald, did you want to remark? Sure, I can just add. So uh, as Ms. Hodder referenced, it's a drop-in center, so youth come, and the, the premise behind it is that, that they get their needs met at the school. So whether it be um, looking at uh, connections to other community supports. So for example, we do a lot of work with income assistance because primarily the house is focused on, um, or, or the, the population that's uh, u utilizing the house is youth that might be coach surfing, youth that uh, certainly um, may be uh, struggling from a, a, from a financial perspective and having food security issues. So youth drop in, uh, we able, we're able to connect them with other supports in the community as well as mental health and addictions uh, clinic services. They're able to, uh, we've got showers available, laundry services, as I mentioned, we've got access to food. And so the idea is that youth can come to a place where it is very uh, youth centered and um, a safe and secure and uh, get their needs met. Ms. DiCostanzo. 
Thank you very much. Um, so um, this hub, is it similar to a peer support kind of uh, team? I know at Halifax West they started a, a peer support about three or four years ago, a group of girls who started it, and, and it's amazing. I, can you tell me what other schools, if you can, you know, in, in the rest of the province that are, you know, started through the actual students seeing a need? Because to me, ac that will bring access. If they see their peers who have gone through it and talked to them, there's more likely of others will come and, and, and open up. Is this happening in other schools? Ms. McDonald. So absolutely, I think that one of the, the biggest successes that we can speak to is that when you have youth that are in school that are referring one another. So they go to the, the clinician and say, I heard you spoke with this person and um, we're able to help. So, so certainly um, the, the peer uh, word of mouth is, is significant. In terms of all of our programs though, the focus, the, the staff that we have providing outreach uh, have specialty in how to do that in a youth engaging way. And so they do a great job in terms of um, trying to, to provide uh, opportunities for leadership within students and uh, be able to support one another. And so uh, it could look like, um, within, within the schools, it could look like committee work where the youth are getting together and supporting one another and, and we, the, our staff are, are the adult that's responsible for kind of overseeing that. Um, in terms of the house, I have recently had the opportunity to go to Lang House that's uh, in Halifax. And so they use a peer, um, peer uh, leadership model as well. And so that's something that we're looking to explore at Access 808 in terms of we have youth that regularly access the house and they are the biggest supporters. And so when we have new youth that come in, oftentimes they'll greet them at the door and say, um, it's nice to see you. Have you been here before? And let me kind of show you around and show you what the house can offer. And so we want to be able to build on those youth leadership qualities and strengthen that, particularly at, at Access 808, um, but also throughout all the work we do in terms of really having opportunities to strengthen that leadership within youth and for them to be able to, to talk to one another and to have open dialogue around mental health and substance use issues is, is one of the priorities. Ms. De Costanzo. Thank you, this is wonderful. Can, can you maybe highlight uh, stories or different high schools where this is happening? And what can we do as MLA in getting in touch with them so we can promote that, so that it is something positive? When kids hear that this, you know, somebody has done something wonderful and I can acknowledge them in the house and it becomes something, uh, it's a positive thing for kids so that other kids look up to this and not feel afraid of actually um, saying I have a mental health issue and, and, and become another leader within that school. So uh, what other schools, what other stories and how I can help as an MLA as well? Ms. McDonald. So um, as I said, or as Ms. Hodder said, we're, we're in 99 schools. So when you think about the, the expansion of adolescent outreach, it's been quite a, a short period of time when you think about it. It's really been since September 2018. And so uh, we've been successfully able to hire folks and have them embedded in the school. It takes some time to establish those relationships in the school and so that um, that others within the school really are aware of the service as well as the youth. And so what we're focusing on in some of the newer areas, so in, in some of uh, the western and northern zones, is one of the first things is that staff meet with all administration, anyone that's providing youth services within the school, they get together to say, here's what I do, this is my role, um, what can you do, where can we collaborate together and really to get uh, the awareness out there because that's critical is youth and people who are embedded within the school are aware of the service. Um, so I would encourage in terms of uh, from an MLA perspective to ha be having conversations with your with the local schools and and to be reaching out to be saying are you aware of, of this service and and um, and to be having those conversations because in some of the areas it is it is quite newer so establishing those relationships where people know one another is um, that's one of the first things that we we've tried to accomplish. Ms. Hodder. Tara McDonald had referenced um, the expansion and the increase in terms of access, and I just thought I'd share just a little bit of data or context around that. And so, um, 
when we initially started um, Caper Base and the Adolescent Outreach Services back in October 2018, which is when we were able to get employees hired and contacts made with the schools and those relationships built with school administration, et cetera, we saw around 9,000 um, patient contacts kind of within that um, time frame, and we're up to about 25,000 uh, youth engaged within that service within that service area since October 2018 until December um, 2019. So just to kind of give a bit of uh, context behind um, the direct contact that we've had with youth um, and, and children um, within this service. Ms. De Costanzo, you're just over two minutes. Okay, thank you. Well, this is very encouraging, and I'm sure a lot of our stats that we have right now, it's really between 2007 and 2016, which doesn't take uh, into account. When will it be um, reviewed, and when would these statistics come up again? When do you expect an update to the 2016? Ms. Hodder. I'll, I'll um, take that comment. Um, one of the really exciting things that we're doing is we're constantly evaluating the service provision. And so one of the things that we've been working very closely with the Department of Health around is an, a comprehensive evaluation. So we had done early um, when, um, when Caper Base had initiated under the drug treatment funding initiative, we had done the evaluation at that time. We have since embarked on another evaluation. Um, and so what we will do is once we have those results, which will be in the spring of this year, we will make those available um, if you'd like to re review those. And that will include um, utilization, uh, focus groups and interviews with uh, children and youth, as well as um, other providers that we would have had uh, contact with in the school system and school setting. And um, some experiences from the providers themselves about you know um, what the opportunities are and sort of what the challenges are. So we can uh, keep an eye to that continuous quality improvement. Ms. McDonald. To add to that, um, after every program, we have an opportunity to survey youth. And so the premise, again, of the program is that we're really trying to meet the needs of youth. And so we have to be asking youth what they need in order to be successful at that. So at the end of every program, and, and as Sam referenced, we've got over 25,000 contacts since uh, October 2018. We hear from youth in terms of uh, what was helpful, what was not helpful, um, what could be changed, uh, did it meet their needs in terms, of a st in terms of them meeting their goals, and that will also be encompassed within the evaluation that's been um, in collaboration with the Department of Health and Wellness. Order, uh, time has lapsed for the uh, Liberal Caucus. We'll move to the PC Caucus. Mr. Lohr, you have 14 minutes. 14 minutes, okay. Well, thank you. It's uh, a I'm very pleased to hear the presentation today about this very important subject and to have the opportunity to ask some questions. And I do want to begin by recognizing that many do receive good treatment. And uh, I do know that your staff very care, you know, your frontline workers care very deeply about outcomes. I do want to acknowledge that. Um, I, do, I do think this is a question of access and resources, though. And uh, I, uh, I noticed that in the uh, 2000, October 2019 blueprint for mental health and addictions, which is the, the plan that I believe we're working on right now, the number one uh, key area of focus, the first one mentioned, was to increase access to mental health and addictions clinics. And uh, I guess the first question I have is something that's been in the news recently is the, um, the North End Mental Health Clinic, which uh, was in danger of being closed and was uh, the Minister of Communities, Cultures and Heritage said that uh, he would find funding to keep it open, which is great, but I I'm really don't understand why the Community Cultures and Heritage is funding this clinic at all and how come it isn't your... Uh, the NSHA or the Department of Health, and, and maybe, Ms. Hodder, you can uh, shed light on this bizarre funding model that, uh, uh, and I, uh, maybe I should ca not cast aspersions on the Minister of Community, Culture and Heritage, but I just don't understand why they're in this funding model. Ms. Hodder? I'm not actually able to comment on the re on the, um, the agreement that was made um, in relation to that. The Nova Scotia Health Authority um, doesn't provide or hold accountability for that particular service within Dartmouth, so I, I, I can't comment on that. My apologies. Okay. In Ms. relation to the funding model for that uh, service. Mr. Lohr. 
Um, so, so the question would be: Is it is it the plan of uh, the health authority to to increase access to mental health and addictions clinics in the province? Ms. Hodder. Yes. Mr. Lohr. Um This was a walk-in clinic, and uh, I guess specifically about walk-in clinics. Is it? And I realize there's not that many mental health and addictions walk-in clinics in the province, to my knowledge. Maybe this was the only one. I'm not sure about that. Maybe you could shed light on that. Is it the plan of the Nova Scotia Health Authority to fund mental health and addictions walk-in clinics? Ms. Hodder. I'll just take that comment. So we don't fund those services. We're not the funding arm in relation to that. So we're the delivery arm in relation to the service provision, just as a point of clarification around that. Um, and so at this time, we do not offer um, walk-in uh, service, or um, as, you, as you spoke about within um, the Dartmouth um, walk-in clinic. Um, so just to give some context about um, our clinics across the province that we have accountability for is we do have 53 community mental health and addictions clinics that provide a provision of um, therapy services um, to both uh, child and adult right across the province. In our rural zones, they have responsibility for both adult and child, so that would be western zone, northern zone, and eastern zone. And in the HRM area, we provide the provision of adult services for community mental health and addictions. Mr. Lohr. So in a, in a rural area then, I'm just wondering about how a person would access that and I presume what would happen is they would go to the ER and then in the ER they'd be uh, diagnosed as uh, one either triage level one or two urgent admit or urgent <laughs> and, and then would, would go to be seen to a clinic. Would that be correct? correct? Ms. Hodder. So I'll take that question as well. Um, so in relation to our intake service, um, which exists is a, um, a telephone number, is the way that we would process um, a referral. So we offer a barrier-free um, barrier free access. So it is not necessary for a patient or a person to present to the emergency department to access our community mental health and addictions clinic. We have a 1855 number um, that is available to all Nova Scotians. And we call that number to reach out for help. And we, we do get um, either somebody can self-referral. We get a referrals from uh, uh, primary health care, we get family referrals as well. So when you call that number, you are uh, connected up with a mental health uh, professional, which is either social worker or registered nurse, and they um, essentially conduct a clinical interview, which is a conversation um, with the patient or the person in need of help or assistance, and we determine at that time, do we have something that would meet their needs and what and, and how quickly do we need to respond to them within that triage criteria? And then um, our aim is to provide that appointment right at that point of contact. We call that a single call resolution. Um, we do have, um, as you describe, our provincial crisis line um, available as well. That's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we, on, um, on average, roughly see about 20,000 uh, people that call the provincial crisis line. So that's another access point for uh, people, um, or for Nova Scotians, um, and, and really, really high success rates within that. Um, we uh, recently increased our um, staffing resources to that so that we could uh, meet the standard of a 30-minute um, response time in relation to um, calling the provincial crisis line, so that would be the maximum amount of time. Um, so there's the provincial crisis line, the intake service to access our community mental health and addictions clinic. We also receive a number of paper referrals that come in from um, primary health care. Um, and so then our um, intake clinicians, which would be the social workers or the registered nurses, would be contacting the patient back to conduct that, uh, that interview with the patient in relation to assessing their needs and giving that appointment time for community mental health and addictions. If somebody was experiencing a mental health emergency, we would be directing them to the emergency department, and that is when that process would uh, initiate in relation to the involvement with our emergency department colleagues. Um, and mental health and addictions has a crisis uh, response and urgent care um, resources that are connected up with the uh, regional emergency departments. And within that, we provide consultation. We're a consult service um, in relation. So the emergency department um, teams can essentially reach out and get connected up with our uh, crisis response team to help provide um, 
that risk management and risk assessment of the patient and they may determine um, and help support that plan to be put in place. Um, and then of course there's um, access to our inpatient care env environment which um, if an admission is required as Robert Graham had described before, um, we consider our beds and operate utilizing the, per um, the principle that every bed is a provincial bed. Um, and so if somebody, uh, if the psychiatrist makes the decision um, that somebody uh, requires an admission to an inpatient mental health bed, we will find them a bed in this province. Mr. Lohr. Um, thank you. I assume that like with the referrals, you're, you're, um, you're, that would be from a family doctor and I do want to point out that in some communities in the Annapolis Valley, up to 20 percent, 20 percent of the population of the community do not have a family doctor. Um, in terms of ERs, uh, what I'm just wondering because what we've seen in our ERs lately is uh, um, and, and they have a, t a term for it, I think it's called stage one overcrowding or stage two, but they have like absolute hallway medicine overcrowding. We've seen that it's um, happening, I don't know if it's happening every month, but it's happening three or four times a year down in the Annapolis Valley, for example. And I'm just wondering what the policy is. If, there, if someone was a, an ad, triage said, this is a person who was suicidal or, or whatever, this is admit, but there's no room in that hospital. Uh, what, what is the policy on transferring them to another hospital? And, and I say that because there was a, a couple years ago I heard a, a tragic story of someone in Pictou County who was actually transferred to Yarmouth. And for, for whatever reason, the, uh, uh, that was the only available one, or Halifax was not on that, uh, not available for them to be transferred to. But anyway, just wondering, what is your policy on those transfers? Ms. Hodder? Just, um, I'll just start by saying just a point of clarification in relation to um, our referrals to our community mental health and addictions clinics. We don't require a family the person to have a family doctor to access mental health and addiction. So I just would like to provide uh, members of the committee as well as the public um, with that information as well. It is not a requirement. You can actually do a self-referral and we don't require you to have a family doctor. Um, for the reasons in which uh, you state it. Um, in relation to um, sort of our provincial bed management uh, process, um, I'll turn it over to Ruth Harding to discuss that. Ms. Hardy. Thank you. Um, so over the past two years, uh, we've done a lot of work in uh, looking at what our resources are provincially and trying to make the most of those, especially when it comes to our inpatient services. Uh, so we have uh, actually implemented, and I'm sorry, I'm just getting over a cold. Um, <clears throat> so we've actually uh, put in place two uh, provincial bed managers and uh, developed a provincial bed board so that at any time we can look uh, across the province to see what uh, mental health and addiction beds are available and uh, to use that information uh, to work with the emergency physicians, the psychiatrists, and, and uh, the individuals in the emergency departments to make sure that we're able to make the best uh, call as to uh, where, where a bed might be available. Uh, with regard to our, our patient flow for inpatient beds, that is another um, issue that we have worked very hard uh, to address over the past few years. We're very pleased to say that uh, nationally um, the target for bed occupancy, uh, unit occupancy is about 85 percent and we are at this point in time holding steady at pretty much 88 percent. Um, and so we're working, we've worked very hard to achieve uh, that patient flow both in uh, to our units and at discharge and discharging to community for continued care. Mr. Lohr. Um, thank you. I'd like to um, move on. I uh, appreciate your answers on that subject. Uh, to the adolescent outreach program in our schools. And uh, I can tell you that it was about two years ago I was talking to one of our high school student teachers. And that teacher told me that in the class of 21 students, nine of those students were classified as had attempted suicide. And I, I realize that not every class would be like that, but I don't think it's that atypical. We have massive mental health 
uh, issues in our schools. And when I look at the appendix that uh, Ms. Hodder, you gave with the um, Adolescent Outreach Review, and I look at nine FTE positions for 42 schools in the Western Zone, or five FTE positions for 15 schools, I just wonder how that is possibly adequate to, to meet the demand within the schools. And I, I just wonder if you can comment on that. Is there any intent to increase that? Or what exactly are the, how exactly are those positions attempting to, to even touch the demand that's in our schools? Ms. Hardy, you have just over a minute to respond. So um, I'll turn it over to Tara to, and um, Tara to speak about sort of the how the schools were selected. Um, but one of the important points is is that we work in collaboration. So um, this is not the only service um, that's available within this within the schools. It's an important and valuable service, but we uh, we can't do this alone. Um, and I think that that's one message that I'd like to get across is that it is in true collaboration with Schools Plus, Family Services, our intensive uh, community mental health and addictions clinics, our caper based outreach services. Um, and so, um, again, in terms, of the, in terms of the reach and our ability to provide and respond in terms of, in terms of access, um, we're, not do, we're not alone in doing this. We're doing this in collaboration, and that's really sort of one of the fundamental components of, of the, uh, the adolescent outreach model and the caper-based outreach model. I'll turn it over to Tara to talk about uh, the school selection. Ms. McDonald. Sure, so I'll, I'll be quick. Um, in terms of where we allocated staff to the schools, we worked with our partners in the regional education center. So we spoke with staff in the education center saying, okay, this is what we have. Where do you see the greatest need? Uh, and that's the starting point in terms of where we would allocate the adolescent outreach staff. But as Ms. Hodder said- Order, time has lapsed for the Conservative Party. We'll turn it over to the NDP. Ms. Chender, you have 14 minutes. Thanks. So thank you for being here. Um, this is uh, helpful for us in terms of understanding more detail um, of all of these issues and this program in particular. Uh, maybe just to continue in a similar vein, um, we of course, as I'm sure you did in this area, pay, have paid close attention to the student's first report that came out from the Commission on Inclusive Education a few years ago now. Um, and that was, we know, jointly funded by the Department of Education, Early Childhood, Community Services, and Health and Wellness. Um, and we have noted in particular the difficulty around tracking how the rep suggested courses of action have or haven't been implemented. So that report was accepted by government, um, but the there was a quite specific timeline of rollout of um, projects that hasn't particularly been followed. And, and one that I think is really relevant here is um, the idea of providing concentrated short-term um, inpatient and outpatient treatment for children and youth with severe complex needs. Um, so there was the, commis the commission recommended um, an interagency intensive um, program that would run in Cape Breton and Halifax um, and that would do this. Uh, it was in year one of the implementation. We haven't seen that, but I'm wondering if there's been a discussion around this intensive intra-agency support program as it was called there. And, and, and in your answer, I would just comment that you know, I, I, I really take your point, we can't do this alone, right? And so, so many of these issues completely transcend government department. Um, and while I know that there are good efforts made at collaboration, we also understand the real silos that exist. So I think recommendations like this of intra-agency programs really attempt to overcome that and to make sure that all of government can be as efficient as possible in dealing with these multifaceted issues. Um, so I wonder if you could comment on that. Ms. Hodder. 
So specifically in relation, just to provide uh, context to the, to, uh, the committee, and I probably should have clarified this within my opening remarks. So for the Nova Scotia Health Authority, um, we provide we operate within um, what we call a tier model or step care framework for both child and adolescent services. And so basically what that means is, is that um, we looked at data to determine sort of needs of the patient population and we sort of match the needs um, to the level of service that exists within that. Um, in terms in terms of the delivery of service provision, we, we provide services for what we call tier three and up for um so tiers three to five for the adult population um, in the Nova Scotia Health Authority across all zones. And we're the provider of tier three services for child and uh, youth services in the three uh, rural areas. So the intensive services, which would be um, our tier four and five, would be uh, the delivery arm of the IWK. Um, but just a comment in relation to your um, your reference in, in relation to interagency uh, collaboration, um, it's really important for us to be essentially very well uh, connected up with the IWK as collaborators because um, children who are living within uh, the rural zones um, may be required, of course, to access uh, services delivered uh, through the IWK. And then, of course, they return home too. So we need to make sure that we have, you know, um, appropriate plans for um, the transfer to a lower intensity level of service into the um, into the areas when a child or youth returns um, back home with their family. So just to provide a little bit of context in relation to what we have accountability and responsibility for within the child and youth space is really um, arranged by sort of that intensity of services within that step care uh, model. Ms. Chender. Thank you. So, uh, so what I hear you saying is that the, the the, pro the proposed project I'm referring to likely falls within tier four or five then. Ms. Hodder. Yeah, we, we don't provide provision of specialty intensive services. It's not within our mandate for children and adolescents um, within the Nova Scotia Health Authority, but have to work um, and are gladly um, working in close collaboration with the IWK to do that. Ms. Gender. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. Um, so I know you, you've talked a lot about emergency departments, and again, I know that that's not specifically your purview, um, but we also know that there are um, many emergency departments that in fact can't triage uh, mental health, and the Dartmouth General is one of them, <laughs> um, to our eternal frustration. Um, we were told that there would be nurses, uh, mental health nurses hired there, over six months ago, to the best of my knowledge, they still aren't um, there. Uh, can you talk about how you coordinate? My understanding is that the hospitals um, that have access to crisis services in psychiatry, that there are 10 of them, so that would be the QE2, the IWK, and then all of the regional hospitals except Dartmouth. Um, how do you interact with the emergency departments that don't have that? Ms. Hodder? Just a point of clarification in relation to our service provision at Dartmouth General, I'm really pleased to um, say today that in February of 2020 of this year, we will have uh, two uh, full-time employees working as part of the, our mental health and addictions crisis service. So I just would like to just add that point of clarification on that. Um, so that is... Um, um, taking place February of this year. So just as a point of clarification. Um, in relation to, um, it, it really does, per, uh, sort of the, 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 the way in which a patient accesses um, emergency and crisis service really does depend on where they're living. And of course, um, what, we, what we get them to do is essentially come to um, the emergency department in, in relation to where there is a crisis uh, service available to provide that consultation. That requires a significant amount back to the back to, I guess, the principal and fundamental team around collaboration and coordination with our emergency department colleagues. And we do have a really, really strong relationship um, with those emergency department colleagues. We have to do that. Ms. Gender. Thanks. Um, so February 2020 is now. Um, notwithstanding the pounding on the desk of my colleague, I am happy to hear that, but dismayed that 
until this moment, apparently, those staff haven't been there. Um, can you say a little bit more about the staff that you're referring to at the Dartmouth General? Ms. Hodder. Yeah. Um, so it's actually February, I believe it's February 13th. I'd have to reference my note, but um, so it is February, th yeah, this week, uh, February 13th, 2020. And um, they will be working very closely in collaboration with our um, mobile crisis team and our crisis service um, in the broader HRM at the QE2. So um, is, is there a specific point? Ms. Ms. Gender. Oh. Just, I just was curious, what, what exactly are the positions and, yeah, what are there? Ms. Hodder. Two registered nurses. Ms. Gender. Okay, well that's great news. We've been waiting anxiously for that news, so thank you for delivering it to us today. Um, many of us are from Dartmouth here, these, at least the three of us. Um, so, um, staying uh, on Dartmouth for a second, um, we are aware that the cluster of mental health services in downtown Dartmouth is now moving to the Portland Hills area. That's our understanding. So Belmont House, which I believe is one of the clinics you were referring to, um, connections, um, most of those are now moving to a lo much less centralized location, um, less available to transit. Can you talk a little bit about that decision and how it was made? Ms. Hodder? So in relation to our leased uh, facilities, which um, um, most of the ones that aren't connected up or are, are housed within our hospital is through a, um, a request for proposal. So that would be through that overall process. And we would be providing, um, there's specific protocol, not to get into too much details, but specific protocol around um, the geographical area. So we kind of have a, a boundary site or, or boundaries that are set that um, when we're putting those requests for proposals out to meet sort of that criteria. Um, and so site selection right across the entire province is consistent in relation to the way that we're doing that, but it would be through our um, request for proposals that would be going out for that. So we work very uh, closely um, with the Nova Scotia Health Authority um, in relation to our space planning um, in relation to that. So there is a, a process that's, you know, behind um, site location. Ms. Gender. Yeah, I mean, with respect, I think that process probably deserves a bit of an overhaul because we're moving a cluster of services in proximity to a vulnerable low-income population with almost no access to walk-in or other mental health care um, towards a location that is predominantly um, high income and close to a number of other <laughs> um, health uh, service points. Um, and you know, as I said, not as available by transit. So we're, we're quite dismayed to hear of that move. And as you said, it may be one of those RFP issues, but I think it's one that's worth looking into. So if someone's watching out there, please look into it. Um, but, but back to the uh, emergency room issue. So, so you said basically someone has to get themselves to an emergency room where these services exist if they are in need of that kind of care, is I think what I heard. If not, you can correct me. Um, but do, would you say that access to tier four and five, which I know, is, you know is what we're talking about here, is equitable across the province now? And if not, are there plans to make it that way? Ms. Hodder. Yeah, so um, just a point of clarification, it's not necessarily the individual person that has to get themselves to the regional, um, to where a crisis service exists, for example. They, we would recommend, of course, that they present to any emergency department um, that's within, you know, closest to home, of course. Um, and it's, it's determined, you know, essentially based on um, also the emergency department to the emergency department because we're not... Um, um, that would be within sort of the mandate of the emergency department to help support that, but our crisis services are located within those emergency, regional emergency. So there, there might be a transfer of care arranged. It could be through EHS. It may be through a family member that would accompany their, their, uh, their loved one on, 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 on helping to support that transportation. So it is uh, kind of determined by a case-by-case -case basis around how we would help support in that coordination. Um, the other piece is, is that um, 
the emergency room physician may consult over the phone with the, uh, with the on-call psychiatrist because in this province we have psychiatry that are on-call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and so it is individual and on a case-by-case -case basis, um, but we do have a policy that um, kind of outlines sort of those circumstances about our consultation process. And the um, crisis response and the urgent care clinics across the province have um, we've been able to onboard additional resources within those that we're really really pleased about um, so our complement has increased um, right across the province in relation to crisis response and urgent care because we know that there is a significant needs and what that's allowed us to do is look at our hours of operation um, you know, in the Cape Breton area, for example, that does have a busy emergency department. We have our crisis response, our um, team uh, member there, um, you know, seven days a week, eight to eight, right? So we do look at trends in terms of when people are presenting and really try to flex our resources to meet the needs of when they would be presenting. In addition to the crisis response and urgent care, we have the 24-7 uh, on-call psychiatrist that is available as well. So it is on a case-by-case -case basis on how that, um, how those pieces are um, arranged in relation to transportation, but we wouldn't be relying on the individual, um, of course, to be able to kind of get them get themselves there. It is a, a collaborative effort between healthcare providers that may be working on different teams. Um, we're at order now. <laughs> Thank you. We'll turn it over to the Liberal Caucus for 14 minutes. Thank you. Ms. DiCostanzo. Thank you, Madam Chair, and my colleagues allowed me to ask my last question, so I'm very, very grateful. Uh, and and the, the last question that I didn't get a chance to ask, and I believe Ms. Hodder started to say something about it, uh, it is about social media and how our adolescent nowadays compared to before are so dependent on and it's a medium that can be also negative when it comes to um, highlighting or affecting our kids, when, but also we can use it as a method to reach them because that is the first thing they reach out to. So I wonder is if you can explain what you started, there was some kind of program you, you're looking into working, what is happening in other provinces, what other countries are more advanced uh, that we are hoping to reach, if you can highlight how this social media and technology is being used for mental health. Ms. Harder. So one of the things that we're recognizing is, is that we have to get innovative in relation to how we are reaching out um, and how people are accessing our services and so um, and, and different pathways for services as well. So our e-mental health strategy is essentially um, based on sort of that step care, that tiered model that I described earlier around sort of in-person visits, um, but essentially would be online. So another option or an opportunity for people to bring service or care directly into their home. There's a couple of pieces with that. We have some, our, um, we were informed in relation to our colleagues in Newfoundland. They have a, um, they've been doing some e-mental health work um, for the last number of years and are really trailblazers in relation to this. And so our connection up with, um, with their team in Newfoundland has been uh, instrumental in terms of guiding our strategy here in Nova Scotia and our partnership. We also have a significant partner partnership with um, Access Atlantic um, in relation to um, providing um, sort of the uh, foundation for our e-mental health strategy, which is our online portal or our website where people would be able to go on and access the tools for service provision. Um, and so they're helping us uh, with resources to support that build in collaboration with the Department of Health and Wellness um, as another partner within that mix of things. Um, so we'll have our website available for public consumption in the spring of 2020, which will essentially host most. Um the e-mental health supports for Nova Scotians there. And so there's kind of a combination of self-directive um, work that's there and then also um, some therapist assisted work as well. So coaching people um, and, and working with people in relation to um, in, in relation to their therapy and in relation to their treatment plan. So it's really 
um, bringing it into people's home um, in terms of our e mental health uh, work. Um, so we're really um, pleased about that. It's also an opportunity for uh, primary health care. We've been working very, very closely with primary health care in relation to this strategy um, because what we have heard is, is that they need some other pathways for people who... Um, you know, intervening really early for because we we want to make sure that um, that we're not waiting until people are are so uh, sick that they need um, sort of the most intensive service available. We want to intervene earlier and really have that preventative approach, and that's what EMA to Health offers. Is that opportunity is another pathway, another option for people in relation to getting sort of access to supports and care that they that they need. Um, Ruth, is there anything further that you would want to add on to that? Yeah. Ms. Harding. Um, yes, uh, so we're very much looking at uh, our e-mental health solutions as addressing um, care across the continuum. So looking at uh, opportunities to increase mental health uh, and addiction literacy, information about uh, mental health and addiction um, illnesses, um, helping uh, individuals find the information or answer the questions that they may have with regard to do I, do I need help? So is my sadness more than sadness? You know, is my worry something I should um, actually seek help for? Um, and look at hooking up, so we're not looking at developing these resources ourselves, but actually partnering with credible um, partners for individuals, uh, services, um, other health care providers um, to, to um, put the right information in the hands of those when and where they want it. The other thing that we're looking at is making sure that the um, information with regard to um, literacy, with regard to self-management, with regard to self-management apps, making sure that they're available and accessible on a number of different um, technology platforms. Um, because we know uh, we did a, a survey recently and uh, it showed that um, most uh, individuals are actually accessing information from the internet through their, their telephone. So making sure that whatever it is that we're developing is um, able to work on a number of different platforms to provide that information. Thank you. Mr. Horn, you have eight minutes. Thank you. First of all, I have to say it's been very interesting in discussing the discussions that were held here today. Uh, my interest is a little bit more in the, um, I guess it's the uh, addiction side of it, and I'm, I know you've just spoken about it, so it was a good time to ask more questions on addictions. You you uh, keep statistics on addictions from all of the uh, zones, and. Maybe you could talk a little more about HRM. I, I think you have in the sense of the hospitals, uh, how they've helped you uh, to keep, I guess, resources as a way of helping people that have mental illness, and I assume addictions too, but uh, we haven't talked about uh, addictions that much. So I, I'm just wondering if whoever could talk about addictions. Ms. Harding, you look like you, <laughs> you went... Ms. Hodder. Yeah, so um, just as a, as a point of reference for our community mental health and addictions uh, um, clinics, which is most of the topic of conversation today in relation to access, um, we provide an integrated program of care. So people who are living with a mental disorder or living with a substance use disorder um, access our, our it's an integrated program. So um, we see both people who are living with a mental disorder as well as um, a substance use disorder or addiction. Um, one of the things that in relation to some of our specific uh, uh, services um, that uh, I'd like to share is, is that our participants or um, patients that are engaged within our opioid treatment and recovery program um, that is accessible right across the entire province. We've seen a number of uh, investments um, within that uh, service area. And what that has enabled us to do is essentially um, 
provide access to more patients. So we have over 2,000 uh, people who are receiving um, an opiate substitution uh, therapy for their opiate use disorder within this province. And um, what we have been able to do with that is significantly um, cut our wait times down. So when we started this journey, um, in 2017, 2018, in relation to um, investments in relation to the opiate um, action plan, our wait times, we had about 248 uh, patients that were waiting for service in this province. Um, and their wait ranged any, uh, ra could range up to 116 days that they were waiting for that level of care. Um, right now, um, we have 28 people who are waiting uh, for service, and our access is anywhere between zero and 11 days. So when I reference through significant reductions in relation to weights and significant improvements in relation to access, that would be an example of um, where we have been able to provide uh, direct access for people in the greatest needs in relation to addiction. So that would be an example of that. Um, the other thing is, is that we have, um, in relation to substance use disorder, we have um, been leaders in relation to the take home naloxone uh, program. And um, essentially, I'd just like to share uh, with you um, in relation to um, the number of deaths that essentially have been reversed that are reported is uh, 79 in Nova Scotia. So um, from our patient uh, uh, population that have reported to us that they've utilized the take-home naloxone kits, um, they have came back and reported that we've had 79 reversals. We suspect that that's an under-reported um, number. Um, but essentially that was 79 lives saved in relation to that uh, program being offered within this province. Mr. Horn. I guess um, within the uh, central zone, and uh, does the central zone um, take care of HRM too? Or, so the statistics look a little bit skewed, I guess, before the central zone. You, uh, but you have all kinds of other, I guess, uh, community agencies that look after uh, uh, some of your work. Like, I'm only seeing 535, 36 clients in, in the um, central zone. Uh, there must be a lot more. Ms. Hahn? Oh, Ms. McDonald. So the, the data, the utilization data that you're referencing um, is specific to adolescent outreach. And so um, that number is, is, looks like it's skewed because that service is the responsibility or that area would be the responsibility of the IWK. Where we do have some pockets within what we consider, what, are, what is considered central zone is um, in um, uh, West Hans. And so why, we're, why that that is represented is because um, when we met with the Annapolis Valley uh, region for for education, uh, they highlighted that West Hance was an area that they wanted to have service. So while typically uh, services for central zone for youth would be under the IWK, that's just one pocket because uh, where, where West Hance is located um, and connection with the community mental health clinic is out of the western zone. So that's there. It's looking like it's skewed because typically outreach uh, and treatment services for youth would be provided for the IWK and we wouldn't have that data. Mr. Horn. Uh, that's it for me. Okay. Um, Mr. Jessam. Just a quick one. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you, um, and I'm referencing the table here, the theory of change document, um, particular to the last section, uh, focusing on governance, accountability, and continuous improvement. Um, in hearing the, the commentary from my colleague and the response related to the IWK being kind of the, the focal point or the focal group to take on um, the central region, and to my, uh, my previous colleague's point about the importance of the, um, the student's refer first report with respect to an overall um, provision of care for uh, for mental health for youth. I'm wondering uh, 
if that initiative or that particular line item with respect to the governance group to guide decision making has a particular seat or seats for somebody from the IWK and the Department of Education. Ms. McDonald, you have under a minute. Um, so in terms of the theory of change that you referenced, that is the, the blueprint for the evaluation that we're currently undergoing uh, for the adolescent outreach model. There is a representative from the IWK, I believe it's a, a manager of policy and planning that sits on the evaluation working group, so ensuring that we are uh, looking at similar outcomes and indicators as would IWK in terms of the work that they do. Um, Mr. Jessam, you have a few seconds. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not hearing somebody from the Department of Ed being a part of that. I don't know if that's the appropriate place for them to be, but I'm just, I guess I'm looking for some feedback. Ms. McDonald. In terms of, uh, from the evaluation working group, we wouldn't have someone from the Department of Education that's sitting on that. Order, We'd have time has lapsed for um, questions. Um, I will ask Ms. Hodder for some closing remarks. Please. Ms. Hodder. So um, thank you very much for your questions. Um, children and youth um, are our future in Nova Scotia. And really by working together in collaboration, um, we can provide the best evidence-informed response to those uh, who are in need of support, uh, to their families, and really lay the foundation on to build healthy and harm-free communities. And really, um, the principles and the foundations of CAPER-based uh, outreach and the adolescent um, outreach model that we were talking about today um, is instrumental, an instrumental service in, in terms of achieving that. Um, I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to thank you all for your questions and your insights. Um, they will certainly guide our thinking about how to continuously improve the care and support that we deliver um, and to grow and adapt to the changing needs of our population, specifically um, the child and adolescent uh, population in Nova Scotia. Well, thank you, thank Ms. You. Hodder and your team. Um, we've had an interesting afternoon of questioning and um, we've heard some um, interesting programming that's going on. So thank you very much for being here. You may be excused. We have a short business meeting to conduct, um, but I'm sure the media will be out uh, in the hall waiting Order. We will um, continue with our business meeting. Um, we have um, one correspondence, and that is from the Nova Scotia Dental Association. And um, I think you all received that. Ms. Adams. Thank you very much. I have a question, and then I have a suggestion. Um, it says on here that the NSDA uh, Dental Association was aware ahead of time that the committee would be meeting last month and they offered to attend to assist the committee and that they also advised the pediatric uh, dentistry specialist at the IWK and offered to have representation there. I don't recall us being asked. Yes, we were, were we? and we turned it down because we wanted the, just the, the topic was for dental hygienists to be here. That did go, that did come up in a conversation. In a conversation, but did we, were we all polled? Yeah, I think it came up at a meeting, and we we voted it down. Somebody brought it as a motion, was it not? Or there was discussion about it, and it was turned down. Can you 
clarify for me. I don't remember, I don't personally remember receiving an email asking us to vote, which is often what happens. We are all sent an email and it I has to be. I think it was in a meeting. We, we discussed it in a meeting. Like in a committee meeting? In a committee meeting. In person, it was brought up. No, and I, I think by your caucus it was brought up. No, I, I know that I raised the question here about how come we're not including them, but it said that they, the NSDA, offered to attend the meeting. That's different than me saying how come we're not including them and having a discussion here, but I wasn't aware that they had offered to be here and that we didn't submit it to the committee for an actual vote. Um, I'll ask the clerk if she has any if recollection. If I'm reading this correctly, it says that we did offer to attend to assist the committee. That's not the same as when I asked here, how come we're not including them? So it, this looks like they made a specific offer to us as well as to have the pediatric dental specialists. And, and frankly, I still don't understand why dentists and, and pediatric dental uh, specialists wouldn't be wouldn't have been relevant to the conversation. But what I'm concerned about is that we had a specific group reach out to the committee and offer to be here. And I don't know whether we responded to them. We certainly didn't respond as a group. So what was, who, who actually responded to them from the health committee itself? I'll ask our clerk. As, as far as our records show, this is the first correspondence we've received from the Dental Association. Uh, so if, if they, I don't know what they meant when they said they had asked to appear. I, I don't think they asked the committee. Ms. Adams. Then can we, as a committee, ask them to clarify what they meant by that? Because I'm, I want to be sure that people who are reaching out to our committee to present we respond to. So um, the other thing is in the last bullet of their letter, it says the NSDA was not offered, or sorry, afforded an opportunity to provide feedback on the recommendations contained within the um, CDHNS um, prevalent more to treat less position paper. It says, however, we would be more than happy to task a small group of oral health experts from within the NSDA to review and comment. So. It's not our job, I don't think. So, well, I mean, my suggestion would be that we as a committee would write to them and ask them to do that. If the committee doesn't see that as its role, then I certainly would see it as, as something our caucus would want them to have an opportunity to do. I don't know why we wouldn't want them to comment. So I would like to make a suggestion that we take them up on their offer and that the committee write to them and ask them to provide uh, a review and comments. And I assume we would need to vote on that motion. So you're making a motion? I'm making a motion that we accept the NSDA's offer to review and respond with comments. Mr. Jessen? Can I, can I ask for, I guess, if, if, if we're putting in a motion on the floor, can we defer it so we have an opportunity to look back at whatever correspondence came through? Because I'm, I'm, I don't remember what, we're, what this conversation is about right now. I'm sure that we... I'm sure that we did, but we're lucky to have a answered record if we had if we talked about it, and if there's an email chain, I'm sure we can get a hold of that too. So I would just say let's defer it until. Um, Ms. Adams. So the so what I had asked the people who were here answering our questions was what the dental association had commented on, whether the Dental Association had commented on their recommendations. And they indicated that they were not aware of the Dental Association's, um, any comments that they might have made. So the NSDA is saying, they're answering that question that I posed at the last session, and they're saying that they were not afforded an opportunity to provide that feedback. So they're making it clear that they didn't, but they would like to. The, the feedback is on a paper from 2000. Ms. LeBlanc. So the feedback, the question Ms. was... Ms. LeBlanc. Thank you. I, I believe this last bullet is referring to the report that the Dental Hygienists uh, Association released in 2016. So uh, that's four years ago. Uh, so uh, while I appreciate that um, dental uh, Nova Scotia Dental Association, uh, you know, wanting to offer that expertise on, and comment on that report, I don't think it is a task for the 
Health Committee per se. This is not. This is a report that was referenced in the meeting. When can the, I interrupt uh, you yeah, to sure. ask for an extension? Anybody? Mr. Jessam. Good. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Or somebody has yes. to move. I, I move that we go another 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Okay. If we have to. <laughs> to the to 15 minutes. All those in favor? Uh, I oppose. Okay, we will extend to no more than 15 minutes. Ms. Oh, Ms. LeBlanc, you may finish. Thank you. I just think that it's not a. It's it, it doesn't seem like it's an appropriate task for this committee to ask the association to comment on a report that was released four years ago. I think that if the individual caucuses want to uh, get that information from the Dental Association, then that is uh, something that the caucuses can, can look after on their own. I just think that um, it doesn't make sense to uh, approach it uh, as a committee. Ms. Adams. Well, so we had the Dental Association commenting on a document that was from 2016. So it seems only fair that we would allow the Dental Association so, so that they have offered, so you're welcome to vote. Once I'm finished, once I'm finished actually explaining this, then we can take a vote on it. But the Dental Association has offered to do this for the health committee. So therefore I'm making a motion that the health committee ask them to do that. If the other members of the health committee are not interested in that information, then they can vote it down but I'm gonna make the motion now that we take the Nova Scotia Dental Association up on their offer to respond to the 2016 dental hygienist uh, report and recommendations. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? The motion is defeated. We will go on to um, our next agenda item, um, our next meeting, March 10th, we will have an agenda setting. So uh, the clerk has asked that we have, um, by February 27th, our caucuses submitted to her uh, topics for the next agenda setting meeting. Um, please note our next meeting will be during the host sitting. So we will meet in the morning on Tuesday, March the 10th from nine o'clock to 11. Uh, any changes, you'll be contacted. But um, so, with no further business, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.